she wouldn't let me read the book, okay? It just little bits and pieces of it. So she really held back. And finally, I got the book. Like, my God, can I see the book? I think I have something to do with this book. So I told her that I, last week, crawled in the back corner of Panera's and sat there with a cup of coffee and three hours later I'm reading this finishing up last page and I said geez this is spectacular and I called her right away and talked to she and Bill because Bill Evans who's here has been uh, a co-partner in all this process here because if it wasn't for Bill's encouragement support and whatever else and you can add everything else you want to Kathleen you know it's a team team effort but really Kathleen is to be highly commended but what a, what a work to weave a story in of, of, of the Jackson Center, uh, how it began, the number of people who were involved in it, a massive number of people who were involved in it, into an, a highly readable, exciting uh, story, and you'll have to read the last page to see how it ends. <laughs> so uh, that's just a personal uh, observation. So Kathleen, you have a few acknowledgments I, I you do. want to make, and I'll let you go. I really do. I, I have lots of people to thank. First of all, everyone for coming here tonight and joining in this celebration. I look around, and uh, I, I know almost everyone. Um, you've been very supportive to me as friends and family, and um, I couldn't have done it without a lot of your work. And there are people here who went out of their way when we were in Florida, and I did not have my hands right here. Um, there were people like Ann Cole, um, Bob Terryberry, others who kind of uh, did some research for me, and I'm grateful to them, too. I want to thank Northwest Savings for um, sponsoring this and, and uh, allowing people to have these books. Um, and those in the audience who believed in this concept in its formative years, um, it was a, it, you know, it was a flying by the seat of your pants, as Carol Drake would say kind of a beginning, but I want to thank those people, but also those people who over the last 15 years, and the book goes from 2000 to 2015, um, those people who helped it, it evolve and helped it flourish. I've been in the background. Um, I was on the, I started with the Scottish Rite long ago before the Jackson Center came in. I was on their committee to help pick the Young Readers Program. Um, and then, so it was, when it was taken over by um, the Jackson Center, it was just natural for me to roll over to that committee. So I was on that for a number of years. Um, the dedicated staff here, it's minimal, but it certainly is dedicated, and all of you have been uh, above and beyond, what, whether it was Carol and Becky in the beginning, or now it's Sherry and, and Allie and, and Susan and... I'm missing one person. Marion. 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 Only Marion that I only talk to every day. I'm sorry. Where are you, Marion? See? I talk to her nearly every day. So I thank you. And then the movers and shakers who aren't with us tonight, who are with us in spirit, as, as you mentioned. I mean, Dan Bratton. Uh, what I had to work with, I had, when this project began, Greg delivered to me um, 15 binders, like this, well, one for each year of, of the um, history of the, the center from 2000 to 2015. But in addition, I had Dan Bratton's, which was equally as thick. But Dan Bratton certainly was a you know, huge impetus in this whole thing. So I would, I would mention John Hamilton, who had the idea, first of all, for the statue um, and was so afraid that uh, the person he knew that this Robert H. Jackson would be lost in the dustbin of history. He wanted people to know about him, and he kind of initiated the statue in the first place down at Love School. And of course, if you look at the book, Jen Champ took this picture that, I mean, you can see. It is the Jackson Center where it belongs, right in front of, uh, of this beautiful building. Um, Carol Kappa, as you mentioned, I never met Carol Kappa. I did know Betty Lene. Um, I knew Doc Dr. Bratton. I worked at Chautauqua under him. I knew Stanley Weeks. Um, I had met Harold Adams and, you know, so many other people who are no longer here. Sarita, for example, too. Um, Randy, where are you? Randy Sweeney. Uh, Randy has been 
listening to me now for four years, uh, it was the community foundation that gave the grant to the Jackson Center for me specifically to write the book. And uh, Randy and I have been in communication for a number of years, and I'm sure you can hardly believe that it's actually a reality. But it is, because when Bill came into the picture, I started this in 2013. Jane Curry is here. Jane is my partner, my writing partner, and we have written six books, um, five, five, excuse me. We wrote only five. <laughs> uh, through the years. We started in 2001. We did Chautauqua Institution. 2002, we did Chautauqua Lake Region. 2004, Jamestown. 2007, Westfield. Took a little hiatus, and then we did 2013, we did Legendary Locals of the Chautauqua Lake Region, and many of you are actually in that book. So after that, I had virtually nothing to do. I wasn't working. Um, I had a lot of time on my hands, and I didn't quite know what I was going to do, so I went, I saw Greg and Cindy in uh, Applebee's one day, and I was actually with Betsy, where are you, Betsy? I was with my friend Betsy, and I said, uh, you know, I'm going to stay here, but I'm going to talk to these people, you, you go along. And I came up to you, and I said, you said, well, how are you? And I said, what are you doing? And I said, nothing. People through the years have always, all they ever say to Jane and myself are, you know, what are you writing now? What are you writing now? And so I said to Greg and Cindy, I said, you know, I'd kind of like to come back on board at the Jackson Center doing something. And Greg said, do you want to be a docent? I said, no. <laughs> do you want to be on the Ed Committee? Double no. Double no. And he said, what do you want to do? I said, well, I'd like to do something like, um, I had written a piece on Tourget, and Jackson opposing segregation for them at one time. I had done research the um, visit of U.S. Grant to Chautauqua County at Greg's uh, urging at one time, and they both ended up to be articles in the Post Journal and on their website. And I loved doing the research. I absolutely loved doing the research and the writing. So Greg said, "Well," I said, "How about something like that?" He said, "Well, I'll think about it." And, you know, then what happened? I was invited into his web once again. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I have to tell you, and I have not said this to you, and I have not said this to you, Randy, either. It's really been a privilege for me to, um, to have taken on this, this task. I think it's a real worthy, worthy subject, and I appreciate you letting me do it. Well, we thank you. I'm done. <laughs> so, you get caught up in the uh, web. Uh, <laughs> and you start this project, what has been the, the surprise? What has been, because you, you've done five books, four or five books, six books, and uh, this is different. This is you alone. This is you on an individual subject uh, matter, uh, doing, dealing with a not-for-profit institution, dealing, which advanced the legacy of an individual. Uh, what's, what's the speed book? Um, it was so different for me because Jane and I, if you've ever looked at Arcadia books, you know they're on every, in every town throughout the country. There, there's a formula to them. You know, you, if you have two, two they're all 120 pages. If you have two pictures on a page, we know how many words there have to be. You follow the dots, and they do all the, oh, you get royalties, that's all. Um, but this, I mean, I'm given 15 notebooks that are on my pool table, 16 with Dan's, and I said, so who's the audience and what's this for and what? And they said, it's yours, girl. It's just yours, which was great, but it was scary, too, at the time. So the process I went through, and I think that's what you're talking about, the process that I went through was to, first of all, take the, note, take the notebooks and go through them. I mean, it took me, you know, endless amount of time. I, I, oh, the, the, oh, the caveat was, don't give me a deadline. That was the caveat. So I went through the, the notebooks. I have all these. So I would go, and they're all in sleeves. They're all chronological. So I would have my post-it notes, and I'd say, okay, this looks like something I should know. This is something. This is important. This is important, whatever. So I would do that, and that would take me forever, I mean, for all of those. And then I'd leave it for a while because it was overwhelming. And then I'd go back again, and I'd see they were articles from the Post-Journal. They were memorandums, they were newsletters, 
um, they were uh, board minutes, whatever, photographs, whatever, and I'd go back and say, okay, I think I really need this. So I had my copy machine and I used it constantly. You, how much paper and cartridges do you think I went through in four years? And then, of course, chronological order you had to do. So then I began to think in terms of the chapters. Um, but I got the title first. You know, you and I had talked about it. I would meet periodically with Greg. The title came to me first. I thought, I need to do that. And it was certainly obvious that you're, it's going to be the history of the Robert H. Jackson Center, because if you're Googling anything, that's, of course, what you want. But then um, it really was from grassroots to global recognition. And as an English teacher, I like the alliteration, too. So, and then it was a 2000 to 2015. So, you know, I, had, I was confined to that. And then, um, and that was because it was decided the 2015, because in a newsletter that went out from here, and it's in the inside cover, these are the activities in 15-year history, the 70 years since Nuremberg. This was something that Susan and, and the crew had put together in one of the most recent um, newsletters. In that time period, you've had four Supreme Court justice visits, 20,000 visitors a year, 18 continuing legal ed seminars, 85 college interns, 10 humanitarian international, human, inter, international dialogues, five plus million views on YouTube, 12 Jackson lectures on the Supreme Court at, at Chautauqua, 6,500 students at eight Young Readers programs, 1,200 plus Facebook likes, 1,500 volunteers, and 10,000 books given to children. Quite an accomplishment. And I thought that was really important to have um, for people to see. But then, um, then I went to a tentative outline, you know, chronological. The first part was easy, you know, all right, how did it begin? That was easy. And then the second part is going to be um, what programs did you have and what, how successful were they, et cetera. That obviously was the second. And then you went on from there to attain international. It wasn't just the U.S. Supreme Court at Chautauqua. It wasn't just Justice Jackson, the Supreme Court Justice. Now it became the Nuremberg Prosecutor. And when Jim came on board, and David, David Crane and Jim, who, if you don't know, were personal friends, which I didn't know for a long, long time, and that certainly helped the storyline. Um, when they came on, it took on a whole different tenor. So that was kind of the way it was. You outline it, then you've got to fill it in, and the book does not read as just simply bullet points chronologically. How did you jump from that to the narrative, which is really fascinating? Well, one of the things, it was a, it's a story. Um, and, well, you, were the, you provided the beginning. Greg, it, it was all, you know, the word, what word do you associate with Greg that starts with an S and the second letter is E? Serendipity. <laughs> and it's all serendipitous, and that's exactly what it was. And Greg went through with me several times I, I would get the things out of order. I knew pr pretty much what had happened, but I would not have them in the correct sequence. So we would sit several times and go over this. But, you know, it just happened. It, Greg thought about it, and then, and I'm not going to tell you th about the, the specifics because I want you to read the book. Um, <laughs> but, you know, how Greg started it, and he talked to Betty Lene, and then he had a meeting with Tom Cardman from Gabby, and then he talked to... Um, well, well, the first thing, actually, with John Hamilton, he interviewed John Hamilton um, after, uh, um, interviewed John Hamilton, but then you interviewed Carl Kappa up at Chautauqua after he won the John Hamilton um, Man of the Year Award. And Carl was failing in age, and you asked Jeanette, his sister Jeanette Carlson's uh, permission to interview Carl. And he was... Greg was this little amateur videographer back then. I mean, amateur? Really. Whoa. 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 <laughs> back then, I said, back then. <laughs> and, and he jumped at the chance to do this. You know, he'd been, he'd been uh, looking at baseball players, and he'd done an awful lot of 
uh, things with Russ Dietrich as far as sports in the area, and as you well know. But then he started getting interested in these other um, other people and capturing it, you know, for posterity. And he interviewed Carl, and one of the things he asked Carl was, you know, who was his role model growing up? And he said, um, Robert H. Jackson. And Greg could have sworn that he would have said Joe DiMaggio or an Italian baseball player. And so he was amazed by that. And then um, talked a little bit to Betty Lene at an annual clam. But everything centered in Jamestown, by the way. Everything started here. Stan Lundeen was in the picture. Joe Girassi was in the picture. Um, Raleigh Kidder was in the picture. All these guys went away to school. Chuck Hall, wherever you are, Chuck. All these guys went away to college, but they all came back. And they, they just meshed. They intermingled. And I think that was a huge, huge part of the success in a small town. And they, they could see, um, here's Robert H. Jackson, who came from nothing, like we all did. And look what he made of himself. He was educated at uh, Frewsburg and at um, you know, Jamestown High School. But if you've ever seen that exhibit with Mary Willard, his teacher, it's amazing, just absolutely amazing. And he came from nothing, and he became something. And that was important to Carl Kappa. And Lillian, I don't know where you are, Lillian was talking. Lillian, when I interviewed her, I, went, I interviewed many, many people in those early days. And Lillian, too, was taken by the fact that here, you know, he just was educated in Jamestown. Nothing special. It wasn't a private school. It was public education. And um, look, what, look, what, look what he was able to do. Look how successful he was. So, and Greg got really hepped up on the idea. And then Tom Cardman, and, you know, they're having lunch at the Ironstone, and Tom Cardman over here is, you know, Carl Kappa over here. And, and Greg is... Greg was the person that kind of wove it all together. Don't get too big of a head over no, it. No, no, no. <laughs> but you know, I, I, I just, I just uh, underscore that much happened in a very short period of time, and, and, and the organization, uh, and, and they did it on faith. I mean, there was no strategic plan, and, uh, and as you wrote in the book, there was just an idea, a concept. Carl bought the concept. Betty bought the concept. The Gebby Foundation, led by Chuck Hall, he's up there, and Lillian and all of that. I don't think we ever probably, uh, the Jackson Center gave you a document until after they, well, I had approved uh, their initial half million dollar grant. Dan Bratton joined us without a contract. You know, it was just kind of flying, uh, it literally, as Carol said, by the Cedar Plant. And you've captured all that, and that's amazing. Well, um, and Dan Bratton had just retired, you know, he just, just retired from Chautauqua, and so tragically, he and Carol didn't even live out the year, but look what they did um, on behalf of the center. And and a lot of it, you know, Dan's mission, he'd, he'd been involved with the Soviet-U.S. Um, relations in those those um, meetings at Chautauqua. Bill, you were, what, you were involved way back then. Um, and they had bigger vision. It wasn't just... It wasn't just Jamestown. They had a bigger vision for things. And um, Stanley, we or Stanley Weeks played a big role. Stanley um, and Harold Adams. Harold Adams was Jackson's nephew. But Stanley Weeks, um, trying to get this, Stanley Weeks knew Robert H. Jackson through Stanley's uncle Emmett Ross. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And Stanley was in school in Washington, D.C. when Jackson was down there. And he sort of was his mentor. And plus, Lee Sperry's here. Where are you, Lee? Lee is a member of the Masons, and Lee was the one that helped me get the picture in the book of, uh, of Stanley in his Masonic garb. But they were all, um, as is Willard Cass, uh, they were all members of the Masons who met in this building, in the Scottish Rite building. So when they're looking for a place, now they get some idea from the Arts Council and Philip Morris that maybe there's a place to have a building downtown, a storefront where you can have a Robert H. Jackson Center um, and teach children fairness and justice. And then Stanley Weeks comes into the picture and says, whoa, what about this building? This building is for sale. And, you know, Willard, you know all about that 
your involvement with um, Betty Lene over that, right? Yeah, Bill, uh, <laughs> Judge, Judge Cass, excuse Judge me. Cass, sorry. Yeah, Judge Cass uh, was <laughs> intimately involved in the, uh, in, involving in the first Masonic injunction in the history of <laughs> Masonry, so I, I, I so there was actually a sale proceeding, so it was, it was stopped for that, so. And you mentioned Lee, I just want to just point out that much of what we know about Jackson as a Mason was a report because Lee did a history back in the 1990s, I think, on Jackson as a Mason. And so that's his work product uh, is, is remarkable. Uh, Kathy, what's the surprise in all of this? I mean, you, you went through, you saw all the notebooks, you interviewed a boatload of people, and by the way, I was the very last person she interviewed. Uh, uh, I, I wasn't sure whether she if would. You were there I mean, it's just one of these deals where this book is going. That wasn't exactly the way it went, was it, Jane? <laughs> what, was this, yeah, what was the surprise? Surprise? Um, I guess because that everything meshed so well. It, uh, no, there, there were. You have not really run into a brick wall. Um, one of the. One of the. Um, caveats of the contract is obstacles, you know, what are your successes, what has the center accomplished, what are its successes, you know, uh, what's its future and so forth, and what are some of the obstacles, and I don't really think you've run into a, a brick wall, and uh, Stanley will be the first person to tell you that they never went into debt. Thanks to all of you, and may it always be so. <laughs> <laughs> Right, Stan? Wait, man, that's the pit. He said, say that. Work it in. Yeah. And what, what amazes me, too, is that um, how it's grown into this, you know, from, like I say, from the grassroots to this international stage now. Um, there's a chapter in their Recollections of Nuremberg, and um, the contract, you have a memorandum of, of understanding with the city of Nuremberg, uh, city of Jamestown, the Jackson Center. It has just, it, it just sort of all happened smoothly uh, because of the people involved have been so dedicated. I mean, Jim, you, you and David Crane, I mean, it had to have a huge, huge impact. And, and uh, you know, Don Greenhouse sitting up there. Don, you were just on board for a short time, but I mean, you, you took right over. I mean, I, I, I've been part and parcel. Boy, did he years. ever. <laughs> But you know, people just stepped into these roles. Tom Schmidt just stepped into this role temporarily. I mean, it's the respect that you have for Robert H. Jackson and, and what he actually accomplished, I assume. So as you finally read the manuscript for the last time and you finally get the sign off on the photos and you do all that, what's your feeling when Faulkner printing calls or wherever, the, Publisher says, come pick them up. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, uh, if Bill's clapping. I actually finished writing the book in February. It's been a four year process. Um, I said, kind of, I was dragging my heels after the first two years. Uh, I said I had no deadline, and I was dragging my heels. I, it, it was just, it was really hard to get myself moving in it. And then, Mr. Um, Evans and I met, and Bill has been involved in the Jackson Center as well. He was on those early committees and was familiar with it. And he said, you know, you made a commitment. Um, I think you ought to fulfill your commitment and get it done. So I've really dug in the last two years, and it's huge relief, and I'm very proud of it. We're proud of it, too, and I really look forward to all of you having a chance to read it, but most importantly, having a chance to meet Kathy over there in a few minutes, and she's agreed to sign the books. I, I think we're still on that, are we? I think we are. Oh, good, good, good. And before we conclude, does anybody have that burning question thinking, gee, Kathy, I wish you would have talked about this concerning the book. It's uh, here at the Jackson Center, and it is at the Chautauqua Bookstore. It is $21.99 plus 8% tax, which makes it a grand total of da 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 $23.75. Um, this would never have happened without Greg. There's no way. And what he said, he could look at the book, 
but what he couldn't look at was the last chapter. He did, I would allow, I allowed him to look at the book for content, but I did not allow him to look at the last chapter. And I think that's probably a nice way to end part of it. Um, I give a little bit, it's called Without Him. And I give a little, a few kudos about his, you know, a little, little bit about his background. Um, you'd be happy to know, I, front and center stage, I've got Cindy, <laughs> the woman behind the scenes. And that led to 20 purchases, by the way. Yeah, and she, she was, she's unable to be here tonight because she's in Hershey helping Megan and the family move to Milwaukee. But she sent her regards. But um, Greg's passion for history, uh, th this was the interesting part. And if any of you, were any of you at Turner when Raleigh Kidder and I interviewed him in the spring? Susan? Uh, when I actu actually say that Greg interviewed himself at, the <laughs> at Turner. <laughs> It's the truth. Which was a, it's which was very truth. difficult. Even it, if you it ever, is, it was the difficult. truth. Um, but at that time, uh, he talked about, in fact, it was Raleigh. Raleigh and I interviewed him, and Raleigh had asked um, how he became interested in biographies. And uh, Greg talks, uh, talked about his love for baseball. You know, he loved baseball growing up, and he worked with Russ Dietrich to get the Babe Ruth series here, et cetera. But he started taking videos, again, of these people. And, you know, lots of famous people passed through Jamestown on their way to Chautauqua. Plus, you know, he has a Chautauqua connection, as many of you do in here, so you're kind of both places. And he became very interested in the biographies of baseball players. And that's when, and his fifth grade teacher could hardly keep him um, supplied with enough reading material. And then he became interested in, um, biographies of other people, and that's part of it. Um, what I wanted to say here was that I quote, throughout the book I quote several people, um, people that had attended the Rehnquist um, dedication in 2003, several who attended um, Gen or Chief Justice Roberts' um, you know, talk here in uh, 2013 on the 10th anniversary. And lots of people, things that were from the newspaper, some of you were quoted in there, you don't even know you are, but you are. But I think Don Bloomquist, uh, who's not here tonight, but I, I think Don Bloomquist said one of the best things to sum it up. He said to, uh, he said to me, he said, uh, Greg will pull out the best of you, he's someone to be reckoned with. If he wants to get some information out of you, he will get it. And, and that's how he networked. And I'm, I'm look, Warren Erickson, I'm looking at you right here now. Warren, I th can we tell that story? That's a sure. great story. You guys were <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's true. Outside, you may have seen Jackson's desk out here to the, the left. And um, it was over in Germany, but of course, Greg wanted everything Jackson here. It's an unbelievable story, and it started with Warren and just the Reader's Digest of it, because when you go out, you'll see the desk of Jackson at NERP, but it was secreted by the U.S. Army, taken to a base in Bamberg. Uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist spoke here in 2003. The uh, St. Bonaventure professor, Neeson, heard it, told his son-in-law, who was at the Bamberg Air Force, Army base, and said, oh, by the way, the desk is there. there. Warren connects all these other dots. Next thing you know, John and I go to the Bamberg, we take the photos, we'd say, we want the desk. We want the desk. They said, you can have it. Well, the problem was provenance. They had taken it. And we knew that they had taken it because Warren made sure that somehow the lady told us, that's my desk. Uh, Bad move. I mean, we quickly deleted that picture. We just didn't want that ever to be okay. So anyways, the postscript is that uh, the Army had it. The Army said, we'll give it to you, but we don't know the provenance, and we don't know how to get it to you, so it got caught up in JAG world. Paul Fardink, who you may know here, is a retired lieutenant colonel, great guy. I'm having a coffee with him. I said, your damn Army is precluding us from having this desk, because it had been three years. Well, he happened to know the four-star general who was the head of the Army at the time. He says, well, give me the information. I'll email. Within two weeks, we got the okay to have 
to go get the desk. Well, the problem was the desk was in Germany. And how the heck to get the desk here from Germany? We prevailed upon Bush Industries. Bush Industries, who had a place in Germany, they went over there and packed it as if it was the Holy Grail. It came here one Saturday morning, as you'll recall, Warren, and you and I and Paul Fardink, I think Raleigh, were kind of like trying to figure out how to un unearth this thing, but that's the desk. It's a long story, but it's an amazing story. So finally, Barkley Wellman, two-star general, Barkley Wellman came here and formally handed it over to us, even though we're not showcasing or talking more about the story. In fact, this is being videotaped, Kathy, and I think at some point, <laughs> Let's make sure before we go on YouTube on this that I see it. Okay, we'll, we'll conclude it. You, you know what else I'd like to mention is the education <laughs> component of this too. We haven't talked about that. Um, that's a, that has grown tremendously. It started off as the Young Readers Program, the annual essay contest, and then of course you went on to um, add um, summer workshops with Andrew. Uh, Biter. Andrew Biter and, and Joe Carb. Joe Carb, and that um, actually, you know, networked more out into the community. And one of those, and I think it's Joe, but I'm not sure, um, was able to get uh, Jackson's opening a, opening address as part of the New York State syllabus in history. So um, there have been a lot of people from the very beginning. Carol Dr Carol Drake, you worked with uh, uh, you and Becky. I worked on that um, the Ed Committee at the beginning, getting everybody going. It was a it was a group of us who were retired teachers. I mean, there was Tom Schmidt, and there were Ellen El Evelyn Sucher, and uh, I know tons of people. There's so many people. I didn't list the volunteers. There's like two pages on volunteers. I couldn't list them. I mean, you know who you are, um, <coughs> except for the first ones like Franny Galbato and and a couple who really you know started it all. I, I just couldn't um, differentiate, but those people, you, anybody here, you know that you're appreciated for what you have accomplished. S Judge Durasi, you've always had a front row seat here. Do you want to say anything? Uh, he was very involved in the I education. Lost the words for June. <laughs> but you were very involved in the Ed Committee. Uh, John Sember was. Shirley's here tonight. John Sember was very involved in it. Um, Bob Terryberry took over after John died. Um, I can just see lots of people here who have, and their yeah, input. I'm, I'm eternally, eternally grateful for all the work that Greg and all of the people that we've mentioned and have have done <coughs> uh, for this facility and for the memory <coughs> of Robert H. Jackson. And we're sorry, Rally isn't here tonight. He just he physically can't couldn't do it. But he he was on he had, was executive director for five years, and most of the capital um, uh, building uh, renovations occurred during his during his five years. He was the one that went out and solicited um, funding not only from local um, foundations but from state organizations, et cetera. And for the book signing at Jane's, I'm seeing. Uh, Ned Ward up here too. Ned wrote the book on the muskies on Chautauqua Lake and ice fishing on Chautauqua Lake, so he's going to be there too. Have I missed anyone for the books? Yeah, I, I did say that. Yeah. Anybody we didn't mention here tonight, uh, if they want to stand up, <laughs> uh, yeah, just to could talk about themselves a little bit. You know, you, you, you mentioned how appreciative of you were about this audience, but let me just say on behalf of the audience how appreciative we are of you. And pulling together this narrative on the Jackson Center, and it, it reads as such, and you should be, we, we're proud of you, and you should be justly proud. It's something that will be uh, here for the long haul, and we, we thank you very much. Thank you.